Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're very happy that you're here. We're going to have a couple of minutes for all the registered participants to join us today. And in the meantime, we're going to give first some housekeeping rules. Today's webinar topic is to talk about our joint masters in applied public policy offered by Coach University and the University of Strathclyde in Scotland in the United Kingdom. Um, we're going to uh, talk about specific courses that are offered in the program and we're very lucky to have three of the faculty members who are providing those courses or teaching those courses at the program here with us today. So first let's do some um, practical, uh, give you some practical information. So please note that you are muted. So if you would like to and to ask questions, you should do that through the Q&A feature that you can see at the bottom of your screen. We're only going to use the chat box uh, feature if you have any questions regarding uh, internet connection or sound or if you have any, if, if you experience any difficulties in that sense. We are recording the webinar and it's going to send to you via email to the email that you registered for today's webinar uh, by tomorrow and it's also going to be posted in our Coach University International Admissions YouTube channel. You will be able to see it there. Um, we're scheduled to um, finish in about one and a half hours, perhaps a bit earlier, depending on the number of questions that we receive at today's webinar. So thank you already uh, in advance for staying with us throughout the whole uh, webinar. We hope it will be interesting for you. So what we're going to cover today is a brief introduction about the Joint Masters in Applied Public Policy. We will talk about the universities that are offering this program and the program format curriculum um, you know, uh, what you will basically get from studying this master's program. Then we're going to have um, from Assistant Professor Gunesh Ertan from Koch University, um, her policy analysis, and I do apologize, I just spotted a typo there, um, a policy analysis course sample and a brief introduction about the wider topics that are covered in that course. Then we will have a brief introduction about the European governance course, which is offered at the University of Strathclyde by Dr. Gabriela Bors, who is a lecturer in the program. And then we will also have a brief introduction about the public policy course, which is offered at Strathclyde University by Dr. Fabricio de Francesco, who is also a lecturer in the program. And then we will have time, um, hopefully 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers from you as participants. So to briefly, they will introduce themselves in more uh, detail, but just to give you uh, a glimpse into who are our speakers today. So we have Assistant Professor Gunesh Ertan, who is a member of our Department of International Relations at Koch University. Um, Professor Ertan earned her PhD from the University of Pitt. Pittsburgh in the US with a specialization in public policy. So she has um, come to our university to really kind of vamp up and enhance all of our public policy uh, research and applied research in this area. But I will, of course, I will let her um, introduce all of her work later on. Dr. Gabriela Bors from the University of Strathclyde is also in the Department of International Affairs and in the School of Government and Public Policy. And she earned her PhD from the Central European University in Budapest, now in Vienna, as I understand. Um, and she teaches the European governance course at the program. And she will also talk about her research interests and recent work. And last but not least, we have Dr. Francisco de Francisco de Francesco, also in the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Strathclyde. Um, Dr. Uh, de Francesco earned his PhD from the University of Exeter, and he has a very wide ranging um, research uh, topic that he will also explain and how it informs the way that he teaches and the materials that are covered in his course. So very briefly, I just want to give uh, an overview of Coach University as one of the universities offering this course. For those of you who are unfamiliar or you know hearing about us for the first time, Coach University is located in, in Istanbul, Turkey. It's a young research intensive university. Um, and we put a lot of emphasis on the research. And this is why we have four graduate schools that are offering now um, you know, 32 master programs, 26 PhD programs, and we have uh, a lot of research centers, research laboratories, um, research and education forums to train the next generation of scientists and specifically social sciences. It's one of our strongest areas when it comes to graduate education. 
that is also reflected in some of the, um, you know, the reputation and the awards uh, that have been uh, given to our social sciences departments across the university. So, for example, uh, in 2020, the university was ranked in the top 250 universities for social sciences by Times Higher Education and by QS, for example, in the area of economics. Most of the faculty members that are involved in the teaching of the courses of the um, Masters in Applied uh, Public Policy belong to our International Relations and Political Science Department, and where we have seven professors, four associate professors, seven assistant professors. And these are, as you can see on the screen, these are some of the areas where we have a particular strength in terms of uh, research and the impact of that research, not only in Turkey, but at, at, you know, on a global scale. And these are European integration, international political economy, and security studies. You can see all of their profiles on our website, and you can see their recent publication, um, uh, you know, uh, conferences, the research centers, or forums that they belong to. And I invite you to do that when you, know, you finish today's webinar. Um, I mentioned this, the strength uh, or strong areas that we have, but there's a lot of other research areas in the department and in, in an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary way, it collaborates with other departments at the university, such as sociology, economics, um, uh, history and sociology, in which uh, there are you know, research projects in all of these areas that you see on the screen right now. This list continues, it's a very long, long list, so you can also see that on our Graduate School of Social Sciences um, and Humanities website. This program that we're going to be talking about today is one of the master programs offered in the Graduate School of Social Sciences and Humanities, which you can see the contact details there, and we will also put the website address at the end. Now I will briefly talk about the University of Strathclyde, which is the other part of this program. Um, so the University of Strathclyde, also for those of you who might not be familiar with it, was ranked first in Scotland and seventh in the UK for research impact. And one of the, it's one of the largest and most recognized in, you know, worldwide. And this is why this partnership to offer this degree made um, sense for us right from the beginning. It's a multi-award winning university that you can also has been, see has been recognized in uh, Times Higher Education Awards in terms of leadership and management. It was university of the year, uh, two times in a row, business school of the year and many others. Specifically, um, its research in political science and public policy has also been um, internationally recognized and, and given awards. Um, and, ex and they can demonstrate uh, excellence at their undergraduate and postgraduate teaching in the School of Government and Public Policy. And today we have two of, uh, of their lecturers with us today. Specifically, we wanted to highlight here some of the opportunities that graduate students will have of being exposed to some of the work being done at centers such as the European Policies Research Center, which is a leading hub for the study of regional development policy in Europe. Um, then, for example, some specialized policy centers um, in energy and health, such as the Center for Energy Policy. Coach University also has a center regarding to energy, but it's more, more um, towards the development of alternative energies, but this is where the good synergies come from. Um, there's also the Institute for Future Cities Observatory, and then um, specific centers or institutes that have projects that incorporate European governance and political issues, such as the uh, Fraser Allender Institute. I invite you to also please check the um, School of Gover Government and Public Policy website to get more details about this. In terms of where the University of Strathclyde is located, which maybe I, I should have started there, it's located in Glasgow, um, in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, um, and it's it's uh, Scotland's biggest in terms of population and most cosmopolitan city. And uh, time out for those of you who are familiar with this very kind of um, it's a very well-known magazine. It named it as one of the top 10 best cities in the world. So besides, you know, benefiting from uh, being an international student in the UK, uh, also the fact that you will live in Glasgow, it's a major kind of um, advantage of this program. Now to talk about the program, the uh, Applied Policy, Public Policy Masters is a one year program that it's completed in two semesters. It's taught in English. So for those of you who are coming from outside of Turkey, you don't, know, you don't have to worry about learning Turkish because all of the courses and 
um, activities are offered and done in English. And the structure is that you spend the first semester in Istanbul at Koch University and the second semester in Glasgow. And at the end, you, you earn a joint award. So why um, should you consider doing a master's in applied public policy? Um, the, the main reason that this uh, joint award was created was the idea of providing very rigor rigorous training in analytical frameworks and methods required for the study of public policy. Um, for those of you who want to become policy practitioners or analysts at different organizations in your country or at the international level, this is the type of degree that would help you um, achieve those type of positions that you want both um, to be fluent in terms of the research methods to analyze and develop and evaluate public policy, but also in terms of the practical um, professional skills to be a, a practitioner. So some of these key skills that will be um, developed as you participate in the program through the courses and other activities would include analytical and critical thinking. I think this is the, the main skill really that you develop here. Research and practical um, skills on, on research methodologies, data analysis and report writing and presentation. There are many more, but um, I will ask our invited lecturers and professors to tell us more about what they see are the skills that are developed in the students that take their courses. Here you can see the curriculum of the program in terms of what happens during the first semester and the second semester. There are three required courses in each of the semesters and then one or more elective courses that you can take. So today what we're gonna have is a, a glimpse of those required courses, the one that is taught at Koch University by Professor Gunesh Ertan, which is policy analysis and evaluation. And, and in the second semester, then we have uh, Professor Bors who will be talking about European governance, which is another one of the required courses, and um, uh, comparative public policy with Dr. De Frances. Here, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because they will also tell you how they teach these courses, how um, students are assessed in terms of achieving their learning objectives, and what type of activities could you expect as a student in those uh, courses and in the program overall. Finally, um, I just want to mention some examples of uh, where alumni of the Masters in Public Policy at Strathclyde University have, um, you know, where have they been placed after graduation. As you can see, it's a mixture of public, private, and uh, non-for-profit and multilateral organizations in the UK or in Scotland, in Scotland and in England. Um, of course, we don't have alumni from the joint program yet, that's why we're here to make sure that we are able to find very talented students from Turkey and other countries who would like to join the program. And with that, I'm going to close the introduction to make sure that we get to the main point of today. So I will now kindly ask um, Assistant Professor Gunesh Ertan to open her camera and her microphone and to share her screen so that we can start with uh, her policy analysis course. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Ertan, for joining us today. Okay, just a second. Uh, okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this information uh, session today. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Melissa mentioned, my name is Güneş Ertan and I'm an assistant professor of uh, international relations at the department uh, at uh, Koch University. Uh, I received my PhD from uh, University of Pittsburgh from their uh, policy school, Graduate School of uh, Public and International Affairs. Uh, in my own research, uh, I also deal uh, with uh, issues regarding public policy. Uh, I try to answer questions uh, such as how uh, civil society can have a role in uh, shaping public policies. Um, I study the role of, of policy networks, uh, these ties, uh, relations between po uh, policy actors, and how those relations uh, have an effect on uh, policy um, outcomes. Uh, today I'm going to um, 
present uh, a, a little sample uh, from my course, uh, policy, uh, policy analysis, uh, with a focus of role of uh, goals and values in uh, policy making uh, processes. Uh, so let's first talk a little bit about policy analysis uh, as a discipline. Uh, policy analysis is a sub-discipline uh, of uh, public policy. And uh, policy analysis is very much concerned with uh, developing solutions to policy problems. Uh, so as policy analysts, uh, we are not just concerned with uh, understanding the substance uh, of a policy problem, but also we think a lot uh, uh, about possible solutions, possible alternatives to address uh, these, these problems. Uh, therefore, um, at the heart of policy analysis uh, is also um, uh, the science of decision making, um, really. Uh, okay, so what are how this policy analysis works? Uh, there are simple uh, stages to policy analysis. Let me quickly go over them. Uh, the agenda setting stage, uh, during this stage, a societal condition is uh, recognized as a policy problem. Uh, and uh, this issue becomes uh, very important for policymakers, rises up uh, in the uh, agenda setting. How this happened, it may be a um, dramatic event like a disaster or some changes in the public opinion uh, may lead to uh, a policy problem becoming an urgent issue in the agenda of uh, policymakers. Uh, so once an issue is recognized as a policy problem, the next step is uh, policy formulation. Uh, and in this stage, uh, policy analysts try to identify a number of uh, policy intervention ideas and consider the costs and benefits uh, of each option and try to choose the one that is going to maximize the policy outcomes. So once a policy or program is decided, next step is uh, implementation. And uh, in this stage, uh, most of the time, public organizations, but also sometimes civil society organizations, private actors, uh, implement the policy. And the final stage uh, is evaluation. Uh, and the goal of this stage is to assess whether uh, policies, programs in place are uh, successful. Are they realizing their stated goals? Uh, and so on. Uh, so of course, a good post analysis course, uh, which uh, I, I will hopefully offer for this class, uh, is, uh, is going to provide relevant skills uh, for students so that students can carry out tasks uh, associated with uh, all these uh, four, st uh, four stages. Uh, for example, uh, a good evaluator, a focus on program evaluation, of course requires uh, students to learn uh, critical quantitative skills, such as uh, quasi-experimental designs, uh, so that they can measure and evaluate the causal effects uh, of a program or, or a policy. And the class will definitely uh, emphasize those skills um, as well. Um, however, I also want to talk about uh, the fact that this four uh, simple stages of policy analysis doesn't uh, very much represent uh, the reality uh, of policy analysis. Our, uh, actual policy making processes are uh, much more messy, much more complex. Uh, why is that? Uh, first of all, um, the progression of those stages are uh, rarely uh, linear. Uh, policy makers uh, lack a comprehensive uh, rationality. They don't. They are not perfectly rational actors that can identify all possible policy options, intervention ideas, and estimate their outcomes. Okay, so this is a very famous concept known and uh, known as bounded rationality by Herbert Simon. In addition to this. Uh, in the policy making uh, processes in, in different uh, stages, a large number of actors are involved. For example, on the right, uh, you see uh, maps of uh, two networks. Uh, these networks represent uh, organizations that were involved in response operations to hurricanes uh, that occurred in the US in 2005, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. And each node uh, represents an organization and different colors indicates 
uh, different levels of jurisdiction, for example, whether an organization is an international level organization, national level, uh, county, local level, and so on. And as you can see, if there's such a multitude uh, number of actors, these, are, these actors are going to come with different sets of values, uh, different sets of interests. They're going to have uh, differing uh, preferences. Uh, they may have a very different understanding perceptions about what the problem entails and what are the relevant, um, relevant uh, solutions. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, most of the time in the real world of policy analysis, uh, we see a clash of uh, goals, values. Uh, what are these goals or values? These are, um, these are important uh, criteria that guide our uh, process of choosing uh, certain policy options, okay? And a competent policy analyst should have a, a refined understanding of these different values, how uh, different actors have different uh, values and the trade-offs uh, involved uh, in these, uh, between these values in uh, policy-making processes. So uh, in our policy analysis course, uh, we spent a few classes uh, on uh, discussing these overarching values that shape uh, policy-making, such as equality, efficiency, welfare, um, uh, welfare, and so on. And let's, now I'm going to provide a short um, overview of, just to give you an idea. Uh, of these values. For example, equality. Um, I guess we can all agree that we would like to live in a society in which uh, equality is a major goal. Um, uh, it, it has important moral uh, implications. It uh, indicates we live in a just society. So even though probably we can agree equality as a goal that should guide when we, uh, how we make decisions about different policy options, when we start to think about different aspects of equality, things may get complicated. For example, uh, when we think about equality, to what extent we are going to consider and include the principle of meritocracy. What is uh, meritocracy? Uh, it is the simple principle uh, that uh, argues that individuals or organizations uh, who work hard, who are talented and more uh, skilled, they should be compensated um, accordingly. Uh, but the problem with meritocracy arises, uh, can we really differentiate, for example, an individual's uh, difference, uh, whether it's that person's uh, hard work or is it a function of some other things uh, like uh, wealth, culture, family upbringing, and so on. Okay, so to what extent we should include this principle when we think about an um, egalitarian distribution of uh, resources? Or for example, are we going to employ policies to balance for previous violations of the merit principle, right? These types of distributed policies uh, are known as uh, affirmative action, and they provide uh, subsidies, quotas for underprivileged groups such as uh, African-Americans in the US or women in Turkey in some uh, political parties. Uh, for example, according to some uh, affirmative action discriminates against uh, deserving individuals who had nothing to do with the uh, previous violations of the merits principle uh, in the past. So uh, even though we can think of equality as a simple goal that most uh, individuals of a society and policymakers would agree, when we start to think about more applied cases, uh, things get uh, more complicated. Uh, another uh, important goal, uh, efficiency. Uh, efficiency is not a public value like equality, but efficiency is a very important criterion we use to assess uh, different policy intervention ideas. And I guess, again, we can all agree that we would like to live in a society in which government resources are not wasted and uh, they are utilized in a uh, in an efficient way. So what do we, what do we mean by efficiency? Uh, we indicate generating maximum uh, policy outcomes with possible minimum amount of resources and input. Again, many people probably different groups in the society would agree on this principle. But again, things get very complicated when we start to think about 
uh, how different groups may assign uh, different values to certain inputs and outputs. Uh, so um, I don't want to take too much time. So uh, so even we may have uh, trouble reaching the consensus when we think about the apl application of these overarching goals to, uh, to policy making processes, things get even a little bit more complicated because uh, in some instances, these uh, goals, two or more of them uh, may clash with each other and there may be uh, trade offs uh, between them. For example, uh, many economists argue that uh, there's a trade off between equality and efficiency and we should think of it as a continuum. As you move towards efficiency, we will lose some equality. And as we get closer to equality, we lose some efficiency. Uh, what is the rationale uh, for arguments? Uh, if we want to live in an egalitarian society, uh, then we have to have strong redistributive policies. What are redistributive policies? Uh, cash uh, payments to, to the poor, unemployment programs. Uh, publicly funded uh, uh, health insurance programs, uh, social programs to vulnerable groups. So if you want to have a strong redistributive policies to ensure equality, uh, we need these programs. How do we, uh, how are we going to fund these programs? Uh, through government funds that most of the time come from uh, taxation, right? So in order to have strong redistributive policies, governments should uh, use a, a progressive income tax and uh, tax the uh, wealthier and upper middle class uh, citizens more. And uh, many economists uh, think that uh, the higher those taxations, it creates the inefficiency in the society because it, cut, it discourages uh, businesses to expand, uh, to employ uh, more people. Uh, and also redistribution itself requires lots of resources, right? You need agencies, um, hundreds of personnel, even more uh, office spaces, computers, and, uh, and so on. So uh, whenever we are thinking about equality, then this issue of efficiency, uh, efficiency old also uh, comes up. Uh, I also want to give, um, a more case specific example. So these are more overarching goals that we consider when we are making choices between different policy options or when we design our uh, policy interventions. Uh, but uh, based on the context of the case, there may be more specific values that uh, we may have to consider. Uh, let's look at an example based on a case study uh, we do in the class about Iceland's uh, energy policy. So we regularly do uh, case study sessions uh, in our program. There's actually a whole class uh, dedicated to, uh, to case-based learning in our program. We usually get our cases from uh, Harvard Kennedy School's uh, case program. And of course, we use the case method learning uh, in these sessions which means that uh, in, as instructors, we almost never uh, lecture. Uh, instead, uh, students uh, enter into an intensive debate and discussion uh, among each other. Uh, and as a group, we try to peel different aspects um, of the policy uh, problem uh, during our discussions. Uh, and uh, I think these sessions are very helpful because uh, every time I do the same case uh, with a different group, different issues come up. Uh, our discussions may take to uh, very different places and uh, we may reach to um, very interesting uh, conclusions as a result of these uh, discussions. For example, uh, in, this, uh, in this case study about energy policy in Iceland, uh, the clashing values are uh, energy development, economic growth uh, versus uh, the environment. Um, I'm sure you know that the country is very rich in terms of um, hydroelectric and geothermal uh, energy uh, resources. And when this case was written, uh, <clears throat> Icelandic banking system had uh, been just uh, crashed uh, a few uh, years early and the government was under a lot of pressure to to stimulate the economy and uh, create jobs. Uh, at the same time, uh, I know, I, I'm sure most of you are aware that Iceland has a very unique landscape. 
uh, volcanoes, um, falls, uh, black sands, uh, lava fields. Uh, so obviously that environment, that nature also has a value uh, in itself. But also uh, since 2010, Iceland became a major tourist uh, attraction. So the environment not only has a value in itself, but it's also significantly contributing uh, to the GDP uh, of the country. So in this case study, uh, we act the role of policy analysts to Iceland's uh, energy ministers uh, and provide him with uh, policy recommendations regarding whether he should go ahead and approve the construction of an aluminum uh, smelter uh, in the country. And during uh, our uh, discussions, we try to answer questions such as how does a country strike a balance between energy development and environmental protection? How can we measure the costs and benefits of energy development and environmental protection? Whose opinions are we going to give more weight? Uh, for example, many non-Icelandic Europeans are also concerned with the environment uh, in Iceland. Uh, they may be willing to pay for some of the costs of protecting the environment uh, in Iceland. Uh, or, uh, for example, residents of Reykjavik, uh, the capital, are very much against uh, this new project, whereas residents uh, residing in more rural areas who are more likely to benefit uh, from this project in, uh, in terms of jobs and income uh, favor uh, this project. So uh, there are, uh, these are important questions that we discussed uh, in this case uh, that touches upon this larger uh, topic in policy analysis, how goals shape uh, policy making processes. And to conclude, um, analytical techniques matter. Uh, and I assure you this class has a lot of emphasis on uh, especially program evaluation techniques, but we should also be aware of these different goals uh, and trade-offs uh, between them, uh, and how to resolve and mitigate these tensions. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are no easy answers, uh, but some options to consider are uh, participatory policymaking processes and some uh, deliberation techniques. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop here uh, and leave the floor to, to, to uh, our professors from Strathclyde. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Ganesh, for your presentation. That was a great introduction. Um, so with that, we are now going to ask uh, Dr. Gabriela Bors from University of Strathclyde to share her screen. Hello. Yes, <laughs> hello. Perfect. And we will then start on her presentation. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us, if you have joined after the first part of today's webinar. Um, we are receiving some questions and we have been trying to answer them in the meantime. They're mostly related to practical matters regarding the format of the program and requirements. So, um, so at the end of today's session, we will concentrate on uh, questions regarding some of the topics and the, the course content that you will see today and that you have already started to see. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bors, for joining us today. If you would like to please introduce yourself and then we will start with your presentation. Hello and uh, welcome everyone to our session and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, my class as well. Uh, right, so I'm one of the lecturers in the School of Government and uh, uh, Public Policy. I focus on, uh, I specialize on uh, comparative politics with an emphasis on uh, uh, EU um, affairs. I deal with uh, uh, policy voting uh, behavior, EU governance um, in general. Uh, I'm teaching a course, the master's course on European governance, which we offer in the second semester at Strathclyde. Why am I teaching this course is because I've been involved in uh, various research projects which uh, were very linked with the uh, uh, EU affairs. So I looked at the level of uh, representation in the European Union, how well citizens are represented by in the European Parliament in relation to their policy preferences and also in projects about the link between the cohesion policy and the uh, European um, identity. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of um, what the course uh, on European governance uh, is about. It's basically a course uh, about um, how well uh, EU handles uh, 
its affair and affairs and how well this process uh, works in practice. So we will assess the effectiveness of um, EU governance as citizens of the EU are increasingly subjects to uh, laws and uh, regulations and policies which come from the EU. Then, of course, it's generally uh, acknowledged and there is a debate in the field that EU also lacks a popular mandate. So at the fore in the debates about the European Union, we have questions about democracy, we have questions about uh, legitimacy. Now, this class examines the EU system of governance through the lenses of um, democracy, uh, legitimacy, but also efficiency. So we examine uh, key processes, policy areas, and proposals for uh, reform. So we encourage the student participants to um, consider the role of the EU in this process and to critically assess the relationship uh, um, of the EU with um, its public. Now, the course is open to um, students from our other, to this program, but also from our other uh, master programs, which are in public policy, um, comparative uh, public, uh, international relations, the comparative politics, or uh, European policies. And it's open to students uh, regardless of their background. So we have uh, usually we have a very good combination of uh, students with a background in uh, political science, international relations, so administra public administration, even uh, journalism and law, which makes the debates and the discussions within the course very, very uh, lively and also very good. So um, we give a green light to our participants from uh, all over uh, the world. We have a very international group of students at the master uh, level. We have students from um, China, US, uh, all over Europe. We had uh, uh, Turkish uh, students in the previous years and we, all, we had a fantastic uh, group of students. And the scope uh, of the um, course is to provide interaction so for um, students to learn together with uh, their colleagues uh, so and also from uh, uh, their colleagues what are we going to focus on what we usually focus on is indeed the process of governance so what on earth is governance and we're going to um, have a multi-layered approach to governance from uh, input uh, to throughput and uh, output so input to citizens preferences institutional preferences throughput processes of decision making and output the actual policy how it is adopted and how it's um, implemented we will look at uh, modes of governance uh, within um, the european union modes of governance related to specific policy areas so from the community matter to um, intensive transgovernmentalism supranational uh, centralization and uh, new modes of governance but we're also going to talk a lot about informal governance and when and how that uh, uh, takes place at the EU level. So we will link the process of European governance with also with major theories in uh, political representation, uh, legitimacy, and we will also assess the efficiency and the credibility of the European uh, Union. So that's in the first part of the class. But in the second part uh, of the class, it will be more of a hands-on uh, approach when uh, students will present on various policy uh, areas and will assess the prevailing mode of governance, how the EU has changed the mode of governance across time in dealing with a particular policy, how efficient uh, uh, EU was in, in regards to a particular policy. So here I've listed the EU social and employment policy. But in the previous uh, years, uh, students presented on um, education policy and environment uh, policy, culture, depending foreign security policy, depending on their um, preferences. Of course, enlargement, uh, but also uh, EU member uh, exit, as it was the case of um, Brexit recently. We will also have a specific session on the impact of various crises on the post of EU governance. So. The refugee crisis is one, the financial crisis is another one, and until next year we will also have a session on the pandemic influence in the process of um, decision making at the level of um, EU, and uh, also, very importantly, how well the EU links with uh, uh, its public and with the citizens, so the level of participation and what's the role of civil uh, society in the process of um, EU governance. Now. Um, how are we going to organize the session? 
as uh, um, Professor Ertan also uh, mentioned, we also have a similar way of organizing the seminars. It's going to be a debate, uh, presentations, discussions um, every week, two hours uh, every week. We will answer major questions. For example, is there a democratic deficit in the European Union? This will be organized in the form of a debate. Students usually love uh, debates, and this is one of the most uh, lively debates that we can organize in relation to uh, the European Union. Has the EU uh, handled efficiently the refugee crisis? What policies and uh, have been adopted and how well? Um, what do citizens think about the EU? What is the level of uh, affection and attachment uh, to the EU? What's the effect of Brexit in the process of uh, EU governance? So usually we have um, debates, we have uh, presentations in the second uh, part of the course. But mostly every week we expect the students to write uh, small position papers on various readings which we assign for each topic and that's usually very short uh, two paragraphs and where they present uh, the major arguments but also a critical evaluation of um, the um, articles they actually uh, focus on so um just to give you a small uh, glimpse of what uh, we usually discuss and this is a uh, uh, something that I've done with colleagues from the European Policy uh, Center on the topic uh, related to um, European social space, how well uh, citizens link uh, uh, themselves uh, uh, to the EU. We have a very good project on um, the link between cohesion policy and European identity. So in, uh, <clears throat> quite recently, we've run a survey across Europe, across 17 uh, regions uh, in Europe, and we want to see the level of EU identity and the link with the uh, cohesion policy. So first of all, what you see in this figure is a quite an interesting uh, finding overall uh, across EU uh, with the blue, different shades of blue, you see the levels of um, uh, EU identity um, here. So when we look at the figures overall, we do we can conclude that uh, most citizens, I mean, regardless of levels of populism, of course, and the uh, Euro skepticism, more than 50% uh, um, of uh, EU citizens do uh, find themselves a connection uh, with Europe. They self identify with Europe, but in a different uh, form. So some uh, find themselves um, as a con uh, their country and a Europe citizens. Other put, uh, others put Europe first. They think they are a, a European, but also uh, Polish uh, citizens. Whilst others, and that's the darkest blue in the figure, think of themselves as simply as European. I mean, overall across uh, Europe, the, that figure is <clears throat> just around uh, 10%. But nevertheless, when we look at uh, overall the aggregate uh, uh, figures, we have more than 50% uh, citizens loving uh, Europe more than they love their own country. So that's the red, um, the red um, uh, column stat. Now, what we wanted to see really is whether this level of attachment to the EU, this level of um, uh, European identification has anything to do with how well various policies are being implemented. And we look specifically at the cohesion policy. Why? Because that really has uh, uh, benefits which can be uh, seen at the country level, at the regional level, and also at the, at the individual level. And we looked at the regions because cohesion policies wor works through various uh, funds which get implemented in major infrastructure projects. And then citizens can um, see really the benefits of those uh, projects in their region. And we find a very strong association between uh, uh, the perceived and the actual uh, benefits from the cohesion policy. Uh, and uh, very strong link with the European identification. So the more they are aware of the benefits and the more they perceive the benefits in their individual life, the more their like, citizens are likely to identify themselves with Europe. And also what we find very interestingly is that citizens need information. So the more this information about this, the benefits which come from various policies, the more uh, their awareness uh, increases and the more they're likely to um, be, um, find themselves more attached um, uh, to Europe. So this is a very uh, uh, short uh, a glimpse of uh, the research we are going to uh, discuss, and this is in relation to um, uh, EU and uh, the link with uh, uh, its citizens. We will have a, a very good debate in relation to uh, whether the EU has a social and effective uh, social space um, or not. Now, what's the added value of the course? Um, simply put, uh, 
consists in the knowledge and skills which you can ac acquire throughout the semester, skills which will give you really more leverage on the, on the job uh, market. Uh, in my course, but also uh, Fabrizio De Francesco, um, my colleague will also uh, say that for his course, we tend to invite various guest speakers from our um, alumni, uh, students who um, work now in various um, governmental and non-governmental uh, organizations as uh, researchers or as policy uh, analysts or policy uh, advisors, uh, former alumni who now work either for the European Parliament or for the European uh, Commission, but other uh, uh, international organizations um, as well. And it's very good to see how um, they actually uh, got uh, uh, there and what was uh, the process and what, is, what are the problems that they are currently uh, uh, working on. So of course, students will be able to link various uh, uh, theories, major theories on democracy, representation, participation, legitimacy, and efficiency to the system of uh, EU governance. Uh, students will get a very good knowledge about how EU governance works um, in practice. They will be able to uh, critically assess the process of EU governance in relation to uh, various uh, uh, policies or various uh, uh, processes of the, uh, decision making and uh, uh, use this um, uh, knowledge um, uh, further. So in terms of skills, yes, we tend to emphasize uh, the ability to analyze written text and to, um, to prepare uh, very good reasoned answers. And that comes through the uh, writing of uh, position papers, through the writing of uh, uh, research uh, essays. We encourage and we develop a written communication skills. Again, this comes through position papers and um, presentations, but also debates, so oratorical skills. Uh, we will have uh, to debate throughout the course presentation skills, which uh, will really uh, help with uh, any type of job uh, students go for, but also a uh, group work, collaborative work for debates and for uh, various hands-on exercises, you uh, students work in, um, in groups. And nevertheless, um, using the empirical data to evaluate theoretical claims will be a part of uh, the evaluation, which will transpire either in the writing of the research essay or uh, through the writing of um, position papers. So self-motivation and time management is something that uh, people develop throughout the year, and it's uh, uh, the way to get to uh, the deadlines we have throughout the course. So uh, we invite you to uh, join our programs and to join um, Stratclyde, but also uh, Coach University. So I'm going to stop here and uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Dr. Fabrizio De Francesco, who also has an interesting course to uh, share. Yeah, thank you, Gabriela. Thank you very much, Dr. Gabriela. That was really um, interesting, and it's excellent to hear that you have former students who then contribute to the to the class in terms of sharing real policy uh, making experiences and and their assessment of it. So, with that, I would like to now uh, well say thank you to Dr. Francisco de Francesco for joining. Uh, sorry, Fabrizio. <laughs> Fabrizio de Francesco. No problem. Uh, today. Um, and we're going to now talk about comparative public policy, where um, this is one of the required courses, and he will tell us more about this. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank uh, you, uh, Melissa. How many minutes do I have? 10 minutes? Um, so? I think we have about 15 minutes, so that's okay. We're okay. okay. On right. So um, just a quick introduction. My name is uh, Fabrizio De Francesco. I'm a uh, lecturer uh, as uh, uh, Gabriella, uh, the uh, Government and Public Policy uh, School. So what I'm going to do today is just a quick uh, overview of what is compared public policy, why we compare policies across uh, countries, city, regions, as in the case of Gabriella shown. And uh, I'm going to present a little bit my present myself uh, through my uh, research interests and how my research interests inform uh, the content of the uh, the class that I'm teaching. So uh, usually th this is a, a short presentation of a few questions about uh, what is public policy and why we conduct public policy, uh, compile uh, public policy. So what it is, uh, is just a, a studies uh, of cases across 
systems, usually countries, but not only regions, cities, but also you can compare uh, across time and also uh, within uh, countries, within a, a system, you can compare uh, actors or uh, sectors, the institution. And the aim is that to establish causal connections, right? So, because uh, as we saw uh, before, public policy is a uh, problem uh, um, solving uh, orienting discipline. Uh, the policy analysts here are interested in making sure that uh, uh, the solution they identify uh, in another country uh, that are supposed to uh, that work in other countries are. Uh, causally meaningful and are not just a, you know, a coincidence. And, uh, and then possibly uh, via qualitative analysis, what is matter is when a, a country import a, a solution from, uh, from abroad is uh, what is essentially is how to make it work. It's not just uh, knowing that uh, a solution work abroad uh, is, is sufficient. And, and compile public policy is uh, have a reason to assist because uh, we want to achieve a generalization, right, of the empirical uh, funding. So try uh, to test uh, a public policy theory across uh, countries. And the final goal is uh, <laughs> to possibly to have a, a better uh, governance, better public policy as we uh, learned from the previous presentation. So how we do that? Essentially, because we cannot uh, manipulate right, uh, what's going on in, a, uh, in democratic country, but also <laughs> so in a non-democratic country, uh, the institution or the, the law, uh, we are actually, we have to uh, make sure that uh, the way we compare is, uh, is sound, is smart. So that's what we need a, a good research design for. So because we are actually observing the, uh, the policy, uh, what we are trying to uh, essentially is explaining variation of policy change uh, through a variation of economic uh, factors, political factors, that's public opinion, left and right government as well as institutions, right? Institution matter, so a bit of player, a minister of quality and capacity or the uh, part, uh, part dependency of the institution. How you can do that? Again, qualitative analysis. And uh, so that where you are um, comparing two or a small end uh, sample, uh, small sample of country uh, assessing the similarity, why they are coming up with the same solution. Or uh, uh, studies, qualitative studies that are aiming to develop conceptual topology or classification. On the other hand, you have a quantitative analysis. Uh, here is a, um, what you can do is a, a sample of uh, coherent uh, countries like EU or OECD countries or even all the, the country of the world, right? Because they are institutions like the World Bank, they are producing indicators so consider the all, all the, uh, the country of the world. And finally, who uh, does uh, compile public policy? It's not just academics uh, like me, Gabriella, and uh, the colleague in Cartier University, but also research units within the executive and the parliament consultants and uh, research think tanks, international organization, and also uh, international uh, NGOs. So let's me briefly uh, my uh, research interests. I'm, I'm, I'm a scholar that is interested in global international policy. Uh, policy. Why is that? Because it, with the globalization and communication technology, is it, it's easy uh, to have a circulation of idea and, um, and formation of a policy network that are transnational. So the 
Uh, there is a lot of uh, policy interdependence uh, through mechanism of uh, uh, competition, why state compete uh, against each other for uh, attracting foreign uh, direct investments. So you have a case like uh, Ireland or uh, Luxembourg with a low level of taxation. And then uh, you have a, a more positive uh, mechanism of uh, policy interdependence that uh, is uh, actually learning uh, um, the experience of other countries or more socialization, mm -hmm. going to Paris, uh, going to Brussels, these are civil servants coming uh, from the capitals and mingling together, they uh, socialize and they hear, uh, they share experience, but not uh, through learning, but more um, social, uh, socializing the knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at, um, uh, <clears throat> in my research interest is policy diffusion that has been policy facilitated by uh, the OECD. Uh, usually policy diffusion of administrative reform. And um, I, uh, I look at uh, uh, regulatory impact analysis or assessment and uh, lobby uh, regulation. And uh, uh, also I'm interested like Gabriella to the uh, European Union. Uh, so in this case, I was looking at how countries are converging uh, toward the models of the European Union. And, and the case studies I are looking at was a youth uh, active labor policy and a railway liberalization. I'm looking also at uh, regulatory institution and uh, I explain variation in the autonomy of the regulatory agency that are uh, um, governing uh, the utilities usually, so economic regulators. And I'm looking at uh, the extent of the variation um, across country um, on the way the um, government uh, um, uh, achieve a social control uh, through regulation over uh, social activity and uh, uh, freedom like religion, press, civil participation. Uh, the other strand of my uh, research interest is looking at uh, uh, the indicators, right? So indicators, uh, how country are ranking or scoring country um, against each other. And I look at the regulatory quality indicators and also indicator EU, indicator of a circular economy that is a way for a monitoring, the European Union is monitoring the behavior of uh, uh, the member states to achieve a certain um, goal like reducing waste by a certain percentage by uh, um, 2050. Now I don't remember exactly. <laughs> and um, finally, I'm um, uh, looking at uh, evaluation and how the uh, development, uh, sustainable development goal have changed the, um, or, or not changed the administrative style and how Belgium, the Netherlands and the uh, um, UK evaluate their policy. Okay, so uh, the module content is essentially our uh, two uh, seminar. The initial uh, first two seminars is uh, about uh, uh, methods, I'm afraid. And uh, it, it's gonna be just a, a brief overview how um, we can select uh, cases, country, region, cities in a meaningful way and what, for what uh, purpose we do that. Uh, then uh, we are um, the second part of the, uh, the the other part of the the, the of the seminar comparative public policy is about how we can uh, how to conduct a comparative policy analysis uh, for clustered country or for generalizing uh, empirical funding or for uh, com uh, comparing uh, public policy theory. We will have a, a global policy indicator, usually with a, a guest speaker. And, and uh, we, uh, we look at the uh, mechanism of uh, policy interdependence, uh, policy transfer diffusion, policy networks, convergence, and the role of the international organization, us, and not like a, 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 um, 
um, producer of uh, policy knowledge rather than um, uh, um, international organization that influences uh, the domestic policy by uh, is a soft power. Hmm? And that is uh, something that is differentiated with other courses uh, in an uh, uh, international uh, relation. Okay, final uh, slide, uh, really uh, practical information on uh, uh, the module. So we're gonna, usually we will have uh, uh, around three uh, guest speakers uh, and there are practical assignments and written assignments rather than exam. So and don't be scared, there will be no exam in class. So we get rid of the exam. And uh, what we, uh, we will ask it to do uh, is acting as uh, actually a critical review, huh? like uh, acting like a proper academic review and uh, evaluating the research design, the methodological choices of a published article. Don't worry, there will be always a way to improve and to criticize a published article as well. Then the other uh, part of the assignment will be a web blog post. And finally, there will be some uh, practical policy paper um, committed uh, for uh, to be submitted uh, actually a uh, policy question uh, uh, generated by a standard organization that can be a re in entire research think tank so uh, uh, an organization that is working uh, to promote uh, uh, public interest in lobby this sort of uh, things and um, by um, the more I Every year, I try to uh, make this class really uh, practical. Okay, that's uh, everything for me. Thank you very much, uh, you. Dr. De Francesco, for that presentation. Let me just open my my camera. Um, I particularly like the the practical kind of um, assessment methods that you presented. The the reviewer reports. It's you know kind of training peer reviewer too <laughs> to to teach. Um, um, students how to take on that role, which is not always easy. So I think um, I want to thank our presenters today because we have actually uh, kept to exactly the, the time that we had planned for each presentation. So it means that we should have about 15 minutes for questions from today's participants. So I would now like to kindly ask our participants if they have questions for Dr. Uh, sorry, for Assistant Professor Gunesh Ertan from Koch University or Dr. Gabriela Bors or Dr. De Francesco, you can type them on the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. It can be questions regarding the courses that they have uh, talked about today or their research or if you're more interested about the overall program, you can also ask those questions. We have tried to answer on the Q&A and the answered part, uh, the questions that were more about practical aspects of the program. So we will have, I will close my camera now and we will um, start to read your questions. We know it may, type, may take some couple of minutes to think of your questions and type them up. So in the meantime, we will wait for that. I'm also sharing on my screen. Um, if you have further questions about the program, we have put here the website of the program on our Graduate School of Social Sciences and Humanities website, uh, the email of the Graduate School. Um, and also we have here as one of our panelists, uh, Ms. Tucha Satana, who is the um, academic coordinator of the graduate school and especially for those of you from Turkey if you would like to get in touch to ask more about the program you can do that if you're an international applicant you can email study at ku.edu.tr I also invite you to start following the graduate school of social sciences um, and humanities on Instagram they have a, an excellent channel there where they share information about all of their programs their alumni current students, faculty members, events like this, um, public talks. Uh, there is an upcoming sociology talk series that I also invite you to, to check out. So let's see if we have any questions. 
So I think we will wait a couple more minutes. If we don't have any questions, um, then we will close today's webinar a bit earlier, but let's let's wait. So it seems that um, you know there are no questions, uh, which I hope it means that uh, you know, all the content that you saw today was very clear, and now you want to check out more information on the program's website. In that in that case, then I'm going to uh, give a very big thank you to all of our speakers today from University of Strathclyde and from Coach University, of course, for um, giving their time to provide this information. And with that, then we will close today's webinar. Thank you very much also to our participants for joining us today. We know it's late in the afternoon here in Turkey and a bit earlier in other parts or very late in other parts of the world. So thank you for uh, joining us today, okay? So um, if you would like to, I think, we're going to say goodbye and then I will close the webinar for all participants. So that thank you very much, Dr. Gabriela. Thank you very much, Dr. Francisco and Professor uh, Gunesh. Okay. Thank you.